This is the Toffee Web Podcast. Damari Gray trying to get Everton forward early on into the path of Decore. It falls and he brings in McNeil. An early strike, an early goal! How about that for openers? Everton off to a flying start. 35 seconds on the clock. Alex Iwobi picking out Decore. Dwight McNeil did the rest. In some style too. Dwight, massive congratulations. That's a massive three points, isn't it? Yeah, massive win. Uh, for the first half, we're outstanding. Created a lot of chances. Uh, could have gone in with more at the break, but we knew second half they were going to give everything and they did. And we defended well. Um, so to go as a unit and we got the massive three points and we know it's a big one moving forward and it moves up in the table as well but now we've got to look forward but for the fans and the lads were brilliant um, throughout the 90 minutes. Sean, how would you sum up that game? Definitely got me two halves. Um, we were um, a very strong first half, created two or three golden chances, um, deserved to be up in the half. Um, we dealt with a lot of their threat well. And then second half, they're a good side. They came out at us. We didn't with, deal with it as well. Didn't deal with the ball as well. Uh, gave it away far too many times. But the resilience of the side is growing. The mentality of the side is growing. And sometimes you've got to fight against the side who are unbeaten in 12. You know, we, we're building a mentality and it takes time. But they're delivering. They're delivering the physical side of the game to make sure we're doing the hard yards. And first off, I thought we were good with the ball. We pressed, we broke up the game and we were effective. And I think it would have been fair to say we should have went up high, um, more in front in the first half. Um, but as I said, you have to do the job for 95 minutes and we've got there in the end. Hello Blues and welcome back to the Toffee Web Podcast, where we get to discuss an Everton win, the third of Sean Dyche's tenure as manager, matching the total Frank Lampard achieved this season prior to being sacked. Uh, It was another nail-biter, a 1-0 win, courtesy of Dwight McNeil's goal after just 35 seconds and 95-plus goalless minutes, and the word goalless is very much in controversy-laden quotes there, Uh, and it means that the Blues are out of the relegation zone and up to 15th, albeit still only a point above the relegation zone, and only three off the bottom. I'm Lyndon Lloyd, and once again, we have a full house here on the pod with Paul Trail, L. Bretland, Adam McCulloch, and Andy Howard all here to review that win over Brentford and assess the toughest chances at Stamford Bridge this coming weekend. Uh, Paul, you were there on Saturday, swanning around the posh seats and rubbing elbows with Kevin Sheedy in the Winslow afterwards. And judging by the title of your match report, you're feeling a little bit better about things after that win, yeah? Yeah, I think we all probably are, aren't we? Um, well, not sure I was feeling that that much better on about maybe like 65 or 70 minutes it, it felt like there was like increasing pressure and I don't know how many games we can win playing second halves like that I don't know how if we can just invite that much pressure on all the time and I can get away with it or not I don't know but um certainly deserve to win the four I think so on on, on the if you if you just like uh what, what little highlights there were um obviously on match that uh, and what, what, what whatever match that they was <laughs> at the weekend if you just watch that alone you'd have thought Oh blimey, yeah, but and hammered these. <laughs> so it was the way it kind of looked. Just on chances alone, and you don't always record them all at the game, do you? A couple of beers in the in the corporate lounge will have helped that, obviously. But the um, <laughs> yeah, it was just it was just looking yeah. back the next day. It was, it was like blimey, had a lot more chances than I remember. And I remember, but it seems I remember Brighton creating a lot more than than they actually did in the second half as well. It was just more sheer pressure from Brentford, which um, which we repelled very well. I thought we dug in superbly. The defenders. Um, Michael Keane and Tarkovsky, absolutely fantastic. They all were really, as a man to be fair. They, you know, they, they, they all did, they all did the bit, and um, we're going to need that all the way, really, aren't we? That that effort, that fight to to to, to get out of this, and um, we're going in the right direction for sure. It's um, I think just a number of the wins in a short amount of time in comparison to Lampard. Did I, if they see somebody say on form, or are we like sixth or seventh in the league and on the form team, or on the form guy, or something like that? So certainly going in the right Since direction. Since Deitch took over, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, next few games are daunting. Or certainly the next couple of, you know, next few games are pretty daunting, aren't they, is the thing. The, uh, you know, 
two away at Chelsea and Man United. Spurs at home doesn't sound quite that daunting, but um, certainly on the right track. It was yeah, great to uh, great to go and then just uh, see a good old scrap and a good old good old game, you know, classic game of football, really, wasn't it? It was just like yeah, terrible weather, tackles flying in, you know. It was um, yeah, it was really really enjoyable one for the purists, I suppose. Really really good game and uh, yeah, fully enjoyed it. Yeah, well, I think I'm I'm going to take full credit for the early goal because I was snowed in, and you know, as the season ticket holder, it. some some <laughs> of the rubbish I've had to watch, and I I put the match on, and I just looked at my girlfriend when the goal went in. I just said, "Look, I'm not there," and they score after 35 <laughs> seconds, and then obviously the the remaining 95 minutes were were much more what we're used to in terms of that that second half. But um, again, it's it's just a, another, you know, it's. It's so good to just talk about the results and the win. You know, it, it's much greater than saying, oh, well, we played really well, but, you know, the results will come. That They're there already. And as Paul's just said, you know, in the form table, um, you know, we're up there under Deitch. And I worked out as well in terms of the, the bottom half of the table. Everton have gained on every single team but Wolves. And even with Wolves, it's just still the same gap. So, we, you know, we've... Uh, We've gained on Villa, Southampton and Bournemouth by three points. Leicester, West Ham, four points. Leeds, Forest, five. And Palace, we've actually gained seven points on them from the day that Deitch was appointed. So it's it's not only got us out the relegation zone, albeit only by a point, but it's dragged those other teams in. And I think it shows, you know, just how tight it is down there. So it's, you know, I would much rather... As last season, we got the points early and we slipped down the table. I'd actually prefer now to be in our situation with Sean Deitch at the helm where, you know, the confidence can build, the momentum can build, the players can get, you know, more used to playing under Deitch and what he wants. So I think really that's where I'm most hopeful is that Everton are in the ascendancy and, you know, we're not playing stellar football, far from it. But what I would say is, is that Sean Deitch, probably because he's been with quite an unfashionable club in Burnley for so long, he does get labelled as a bit of a, you know, maybe a Route 1 manager, or, you know, maybe thrown in with like your Allardyce and your Pulises but for me I really enjoy watching this Everton team I know that you know we're far from the finished article but from what I see you know I, I, I enjoy the fact that you know there's a there's a plan there's a you can see there's consistency from the set pieces particularly and there's a good build up and I feel like every player knows his role it's very structured and I think that you know, you can you can be maybe some fans might be critical of maybe the lack of substitutions and in game management, but I think that's because I think Deitch is just trying to really drill the players that are on the pitch and trusting them. Um, so for me, it's it's just that compared to Lampard, I think what's what's really astounding is just how little substance there was to Lampard's play. You know, I I watched Lampard's team for twelve months and still. I don't know what he was trying to do. I don't know what Everton mm-hmm. were trying to do under him. Whereas with Deitch, you, you can just say, just simple things like even the set piece deliveries and where we've got certain players and defending set pieces as well, and just the 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 sort of cohesion. I know I know that there are gaps in the squad, but you, you can see now, and I'm sure if we all you know talked about what the team would be like come May, I think we've all got a pretty good idea. Even though there's been a few changes. And I think that's something that's really good as well, is that you can see he's assessed the team and now he's making changes to make us better, um, you know, by bringing in Godfrey to maybe give us a bit more energy and a bit more impetus. He's, you know, he's tried basically every forward that's available. He's tried them in the position and it seems that in the last two games you would expect Damari Gray. You know, as as we've said on the podcast, you know, Damari Gray is probably the one and you know, in 135 Mm -hmm. minutes of football that he was on the pitch, we had the ball in the back of the net four times. So, you know, (laughs) the fans, I think, have been proved right a lot because I think what it is is for a manager, you've got a philosophy and a style and a plan and you see things on the training ground. But, you know, like that term about a fresh pair of eyes, I think supporters do see things that maybe managers miss just because we do only see match day, whereas Sean Deitch is with his players, what, four, five, six times a... So for, for us, sometimes I think it's very obvious what needs to happen, but I think we've seen from from the managers that we've had over the last seven years, they they seem to be, you know, you could almost say they're stubborn in what they've done. But I think it's just that as football fans, because we only see them on the match day, we can see different things maybe. 
And so I think that's that's what I mean. It's you know it might be obvious that Demaru Gray was the man to pick, but it's just good that you know that's that seems to be proved true. But it is it's encouraging that you know Deitch has mixed it up a bit and that we've you know we've got points on the board and it's you know we've all done our predictions, haven't we? And I think we're probably on track for where we thought in terms of you know we might not even reach that magic forty point mark, but it is that tight down there. I just I feel that we are in the ascendancy and. You know, we've got three really difficult games coming up, but I'm not really daunted by them. You know, I, we might lose all three. You know, that's that's a possibility. But I still feel we've got enough from other games that, you know, that I feel just we've got a real re- results-driven approach, and I think that's what it had to be going into the, the, the last few months of the season. Yeah, absolutely. Just before um, Adam and, and Andy Wayne, just on that long ball issue, I've seen, I've seen a couple of tweets about, people sort of moaning about it being long ball. I don't see it as, as just long ball. I mean, I think it's a, there's a really good mix. If you look at that, the goal, the way that Alex Awobi, that touch into the, from the wing, that first time ball in from to Decore, and then, the, you know, obviously the layoff to McNeil and the goal. I mean, that wasn't sort of typical Deitch ball, Allardyce ball, any of that stuff that you want to kind of, or even like the Wimbledon crazy gang style that I've seen someone compare it to. I mean, if you look at the way that the team, the 85 team played, they played a, a really good mix of long ball, of direct football, of passing football. And that's, I mean, it's just the Everton way. So I, I, I think that, um, you know, we can have the discussion about what Deitch brings to Everton. You know, hopefully once we're safe and we're kind of looking ahead to what we, what we might become under him. But for, for right now, I mean, I, I don't see us as just being a, a kind of a boring long ball team at all. I, I totally agree. I think I think we're playing direct football at times, but it's all yeah. with a purpose. It serves a purpose. It gets us further up the pitch where earlier on in the season, how many times were we playing ourselves into trouble by tapping it around at the back? And we know as a fan base, because we've seen that happen time and time again under under other managers, that it's not it's not really a popular way to play at Goodison. It doesn't work unless you've got the personnel, which we clearly didn't have the personnel that suited. But as you've just said, El, in terms of a way that Deitch has got us set up now, He's making the most of the personnel. He's assessed. He's looked. He's got a way of playing that, I, like you say, I, I certainly haven't found it boring. I think that first half was a really exciting side who were trying things on the front foot. You could argue that some of it's a little predictable at times, but it's it's been done well, so you you don't mind. And and if it, if we're creating chances, if that comes from a knockdown or a direct ball into the box or a set piece, then it's still a chance. Whereas for so much. Of this season under Lampard, we, we weren't creating any chances. It was it was akin to those days under Allardyce, but without the sort of draw at the end of it, it felt very <laughs> frustrating because you'd, you'd think we, we should be chasing a game and throwing ourselves into it. Um, I think it was on Saturday, it could have been a lot more comfortable and I'm sure we'll talk about um, about VAR decisions and the like. I, and I also think it's, it's a very Everton thing to score early on and have that sort of initial moment of joy and euphoria, which quickly dissolves away and all you're left with is the creeping fear that, oh no, now now we've scored too early. <laughs> we've scored too early. Um, and I'm sure that's that's from past experience and uh, and yeah, just a little bit of glass half empty. But it did it did feel like a long game at times in that second half. But we I think we showed both, both of the best sides of what we've seen under Deitch. We were really, as I say, aggressive and... The pressing against a side like Brentford, who were renowned for that, we, we kept them really quiet and sort of beat them at their own game in the first half, I thought, as well as creating lots of chances. Um, we showed some composure for the first goal. I think it's, I think it's a fantastic goal. It's a, it's a sweet strike, but as you mentioned, Lyndon, the build-up to it um, from Iwobi. Decore found that moment in the final third where he just took his time a little more, found the right pass, had a second, and and we we, we capitalised on it. And yeah, as as we know, it could have been more. Whereas the second half, yeah, could it have been better? Certainly, but we showed a bit of steel and a bit of resolve. And I'm sure coming out of that, however hard it was at times um, to to suffer through, as you said, Paul, after about an hour, I was I was really really touchy. Um, <laughs> partly yeah. partly because of the result earlier in the day, which I mean. <laughs> As, as you said, Lyndon, in slightly stronger terms, don't you just hate them? Um, yeah. <laughs> but one time. Um, but I think knowing how important Saturday was and seeing where it's left us in the table, 
I think, yeah, hopefully, h- however these next three games go and however hard it might look on paper, we beat the informed side of the division. We we beat them, I'd say, fairly comfortably on balance if we were to look at the whole 90 minutes. And it's it's just another platform to build on. So I think I think we can go into those games a lot more confident and certainly with a little bit of breathing room, even though it is still, it's incredibly tight, isn't it? And there are so many other sides who are, are getting as you said, El, in terms of the way we've we've gained points for other sides who are going to be worried about what's what's coming down the line. So I think I think Saturday was massive. I'm just so relieved and happy that we came out of it with three points. I don't know if it was just me, but my full time feeling this week was slightly less dramatic than I can remember it feeling against Leeds and Arsenal. It was more of a kind of it was more of a well, of course, I was relieved that the game was over because I, you know, Brentford were on top and the flow of the game had changed from the first half. But there was just a kind of almost a feeling that I think we'll be OK here in in where the other games where it's been one nil, especially. It's just been that huge, just blow a whistle referee any time now, please. Five minutes ago would have been nice, you know, but I, I felt on, I don't know how it was, it was probably different for all of us because we probably watched games differently, but it just felt as if we can see this ship gradually turning round um, and it's, it's going to take time because it's a big old ship and it's been going the wrong way for a while, um, <laughs> but I think we there's that sense now that we can feel and we've experienced the days when it's okay in the end. You know, already under Dyche, we've had the, the good wins. Forest was a disappointing result, but it wasn't the Everton capitulation that we've all watched before. You know, you can see there are markers now in terms of what we can do and what, what, what we can achieve, even if we're under the cosh at the end of games. And to me, it was just... It was a little, little bit more serene in in terms of I, I was I was confident that we would defend well. I mean, apart from the goalkeeper at the end, I thought that would be the most Everton thing in the world if the goalkeeper scores a header. Um, <laughs> yeah. That moment aside, um, it felt at least felt. I know the action was down our end a lot, but at least it, it felt as if I had a confidence in us that we could see a game out, um, and. I think that's the side of Dyche that we all expected. I think you're absolutely right with the other sides of Everton's game. I don't think I don't think it looks necessarily how we'd expect it to, but I'm pleased. Um but I do I, I know I've said this before. Um I rate Sean Dyche and I always have done because again he's got the best out of what he's been given and I think this is the best he's been given, quite frankly. Um and I, you know, I think if, if if we can do the old stay up at all costs, um, I, I think it, I, I think he could be a good coach for us. I really do. Um, but yeah, and and the, and the purpose thing that you just mentioned then, Everton do play with a purpose, both defensively and offensively, um, which mm-hmm. we haven't seen for a, for a little while, um, and it makes a huge difference. Um, so yeah, I mean, Paul said we can't go many second halves like that. Well. We can if we have first halves like that, like that, you know, it, you know, and take a few more of our chances, you know, or oh, VAR doesn't do what it did. Well, yeah, exactly. I, I, I don't think I can take many more second halves like that because I don't. Know, for, for some reason, this one just felt this one just felt huge even before the Bournemouth Liverpool game. This game just felt huge because obviously we've gone three before that without winning, um, and it was. I mean, and as we said before, that we were running out of matches to to to, to get this thing done, you know. Um, and it just felt like, out of looking ahead to, to the Spurs and the Newcastle games, the home games, I just felt like Brentford, even though they're lower in the table, would just be a trickier game. Um, and I think it just just shows you how important confidence and mentality are in football, because you know, until yesterday, obviously Newcastle had gone off the board a bit, and Tottenham are a bit of a weird bunch where you've, they can kind of go into a bit of a sulk either them or their manager, and that when things aren't going their way. Um, and so I would still fancy us against those two um, at home if we're in the mood. But I just, you just knew that Brentford weren't going to lie down in this one. They were going to come out strong. 
that Thomas Frank was going to have changes to make in the second half to try and change the game, to try and get a result. And so it, it wasn't so much a lack of confidence in our ability to keep them out. It was more of kind of a fear that they would just find something. I mean, Ivan Tony is such a good striker um, and they're so kind of direct. And I just, I just was concerned, obviously, that, that, that the one goal wasn't going to be enough. Um, and <laughs> it's, it, we should have been 2-0 up. You know, and and this is, um, you know, this um, this might be the most livid I've been about a VAR decision. I think uh, up to this point, I'm going to try very hard not to swear here because it's making me angry just thinking about it again. Because you know, this was uh, yet another decision where we've been shafted, obviously. But um, I think the the reason why it was it made me so angry and so stressed, I think, it was just because that second goal would have been so important to us. You know, obviously, we don't score that many. Uh, and it's going into the second half, 2 nil up is very different to 1 nil up. And I think we saw that the way that the game the, the game eventually turned turned out. I think you know, we I think some some of the reports have suggested that it was kind of ninety five minutes backs against the wall. It wasn't. We were we were on top in the first half, and I think both managers acknowledged that it was a game of two halves. So I think we acquitted ourselves really well in the first half, but we were just never able to find our feet in the second from an attacking point of view. So we were kind of hanging on. Um but uh you know, the rules around handball are so farcical now. You can have a defender block the ball with his hand in the box, but it's not a penalty if his arm's supporting his body on the floor. But the merest hint of a handball by an attacker in scoring a goal, and it's automatically ruled out. And it just makes no sense. I mean, I've watched that grey handball, in quotes, incident numerous times, and I still can't see how you determine which arm it hit, if it hit an arm. Um, but it doesn't matter because, I mean, the point is that it's so bloody hard to tell. And, and that is the point. Number one, the decision to overturn Simon Hooper's decision goes against Howard Webb's recent directive that the officials need to go more by the referees ruling on the pitch. Number two, it wasn't clear or obvious by any stretch of the imagination. So the goal should have stood. And number three, I mean, if, if David Coote has doubts, he should have re- recommended Hooper go to the monitor. But I can't understand why, in an instance where something as important as a goal we're not talking about, you know, a, a red card, which we've obviously had someone go to the monitor uh, in the Newcastle game last year and actually overturn his own decision. Um, something as fundamentally as important as a goal, the referee should go to the pitch side monitor. The, the, the game has stopped. You know, there's no harm in taking an extra 30 seconds to go and review it. It's what they do in the NFL. It's what they do in the NBA. They The really important decisions, they go to a monitor and make sure that, you know, they've got the decision right. And it's not someone... 200 miles away, um, you know, making a decision based on a very blurry replay. So, um, yeah, I, I'm still not over that one. And uh, I'm just glad we won because otherwise I'd probably have self-spontaneously combusted. <laughs> just at this point, it, it, are we in agreement? Is there a general consensus that the referee on pitch gave a goal? Because yeah. I think uh, it's it, yeah. yes. a bit of a grey yeah. area, I thought. He blows the whistle, but he immediately acknowledges, I think it's Ben Mee. Ben Mee, I think one of the Brentford defenders signals to him and he immediately acknowledges and touches his ear as if to say, I'm, no, this is obviously going to be a VAR check because I think they had a suspicion that it was handball. But yes, he gave the goal, right. I think. So, so it's because, because it's, it's not a moot point. It, there's a huge difference between Absolutely, the referee... Yeah decision being overturned and the, mm-hmm. the the VAR backing up the referee because the VAR we we've, yes. we've been told don't want to change on field decisions so if it depends really what the referee and we we may not know i guess for sure what he was thinking if it was solely left to him because or, or uh, if you if you say i i mean i i didn't see a uh, I didn't see a moment where the referee either definitely gave a goal or definitely said, no, that's not a goal. So I don't know really what the, I don't know whether it was a VAR decision or the VAR has been used to uphold the referee's decision. I don't know. Yeah, it was a funny one because he blew the whistle. The sound of the whistle sounded like he'd blown for an infringement, but I don't think at any point that he signals either a foul for Brentford, you know, um, and, and, and I think the fact that he was behind Gray is is the the important bit here. Is he couldn't actually make a decision on his own anyway. So I think he gave the goal. 
just based on like the body language of the Brentford players. Once once it were once the the Abbott and lads went off like celebrating, most of them were like very deflated and all. You know, so um, yeah, I think I think I, you know, yeah, I, I know what you mean, Andy. You, you, I, I don't recall them, like points into the halfway line. You know, what I mean, I, I maybe have to see it again, but uh, we certainly thought it was a goal at the time in the in the in the, in the stadium. To be fair, when these, I wasn't, so, I didn't feel so deflated. I mean, if you're talking about, oh, that that should be a question. So we 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 we, <laughs> we feel we've been so hard done to with VAR calls. I think we've already clocked up enough to make that one of the questions at the end of the end of the podcast now, haven't we? But um. I think the most uh, the, the most ridiculous I felt was that um, that Brighton one. I think when they first came out away when there uh, was it Aaron Connolly is that his name? The, that was that, that was that was just, that was absolutely farcical. That was that, that was insane. But but they, they showed the still of um like it like it on the monitor at Goodison, I think, and um it looked, you, from that you thought oh okay fair enough it's handball. So we didn't really think much of it at the time. It's only when they got back like the next the next, next morning yesterday morning. Watching that match uh, on the highlights, it was just like, well, hang on a minute, that's not clear and obvious at all. And you're right, going against um, Howard Webb's directive, it's uh, and then you see what happened in the Newcastle game on um, on Sunday, and, and and you're saying, oh no, he's back backing up the referees on field decisions. It's like, well, what is this then? <laughs> it's a, 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 there isn't a week that goes by now which just uh, when VAR isn't called into question, you know. It's just, it's yeah it's it, it's a real it's a real mess isn't it and um, luckily it didn't cost us on this occasion but it easily could have couldn't it you know the way the second half went you know something could have gone in and it might have been very very important so um, yeah luckily it didn't cost us but uh, yeah not good as as usual I suppose it, it could have been season defining couldn't it back back goal it was it was the perfect time to score. Um, it was an even better version of Dyke's ball than that Nottingham Forest goal. It was it was sublime in its execution, um, <laughs> but I think again it goes back to this strange forensic level of detail. Which and okay, I mainly watch Everton. It's rare that I dabble in watching other sides, but it, it does seem that something happens um, with with VAR and Everton where the details are poured over in a way that. Is, is unsettling. If, if we're talking about that second half in like it lasted forever, it was a really, really long check. And the reason it's a long check is because, as we've said, even looking at the replays, it's very, very inconclusive. And so there's no benefit of a doubt to the attacker. There's no benefit of doubt for the referee's on-field decision, which seemed to be given as a goal. And as you said, Paul, the Brentford players, apart from Ben Mee, who I'm going to say is maybe doing a little bit of gamesmanship by immediately appealing, Everyone else is resigned to the fact that that's a goal, but we, we we've scored. So I think I think it's a really really poor decision. But as as we've said, thank God it didn't cost us because that that would have really really rankled. Um, I think we're right to still be angry about it. But yeah, at least we came out of that with three points because it, it would have it would have just typified sadly what we've seen a lot of under VAR, which is decisions costing us. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to sit here and sound like I've got a tinfoil hat on talking about conspiracy theories, but, you know, I'm not going to Go cry on. corruption. But I feel that if you look at the decisions based on this weekend, VAR isn't fair. It allows the Premier League to shape their narrative. And I, I truly believe that if it's nil-nil, I think that goal gets given. But because it makes it 2 nil before half-time, I, I, I just find it strange because what... Where the point I'm making about this about narrative is the referees aren't mic'd up, they don't do media interviews. So technically, when you see so many inconsistencies and the reason you know, the the reason behind it, they can rule out any goal they like and and, and sort of get away with it now. Because that 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 you as we've all said, you can't rule that goal out based on what's seen and what's happened in the game. And you know, Nick Pope at Newcastle, you know, it's pretty, everybody's really, you know, agreed. But if Newcastle lose that game, that's Newcastle slipping further behind Tottenham in the race for the top four. A relegation fight, including Everton, gets far more viewers than if it includes Bournemouth. So, you know, I'm not going to go as far as corruption, but (laughs) I suppose that is what I'm saying in a roundabout way because because there isn't any explanation for that, that, that they're making wrong decisions. And so for me, I think that VAR has just allowed them to make worse decisions without any scrutiny. There's no accountability. There's there's no 
there's no referees, and you know if if you if you watch Sky Sports and Dermot Gallagher will will back every decision, and I I just yeah. I think if you've got the referee because this is the thing we've all discussed this, and it's all ifs buts and maybes because we can only guess at how the decision's been come to. If they're mic'd up, you can hear what the reasoning is, how long they're taking, what they're doing, and then we can all sit there and go, well, he thinks this and we disagree, but but. I just feel like they they can pick and choose who gets sent off, what goal gets given, and I feel like VAR like just shrouds it and gives them a bit of protection, really. Because as I say, they make that decision, and then nobody comes out to explain. Nobody nobody backs up what 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 the decision has been. So I know it sounds ridiculous to talk corruption and stuff, and you know, really, truly, I don't believe that. But I think maybe like subconsciously, there's a there's a, I don't know, a way to keep the game more entertaining and a way to keep the season going until until May. Because, you know, my guess would be if Brentford were to get into Europe, for example, I'm sure they'd get decisions against them next year. Just because Brentford in Europe isn't as, as uh, you know, won't as get as many viewers as a, as a Tottenham or a Liverpool or, or whatever. So it does, it just sounds bizarre. And as I'm saying it, it sounds stupid. But there's got to be a reason for these. It's just so blatantly, obviously wrong. It's like me refereeing a, a Merseyside derby. Everton basically like pushing Mohamed Salah in the box and kicking him, and me going N- no penalty. And then I, I blow the final whistle, and I don't have to explain myself. It's just done. That's what it is. So for me, I do. I know. I know. Paul was quite frustrated with the officials last week. And you know I, I'm there with you, Paul. I mean, I'm I'm far worse now, <laughs> but you know, I do, I, you know, it, it just, it's bizarre to use the word corruption, and I don't believe that. But there's just something that doesn't add up for me. There's just no um, no transparency with it, and they, they can they can make whatever call they like. Uh, uh, yeah, on the corruption thing, I kind of go uh, along with the way that I view politicians is that they often don't have the um, the wherewithal to actually pull off whatever it is you're accusing them of. I think, you know, to, to, to think that they could pull off a grand scale corruption on this scale would actually give them more credit than I think they deserve. I think your your uh, your psychology thing, I think, is is more is closer to the point, I think, you know. There, there are there are definitely things where the psychologically the pattern of the game I think it influences their decisions. But you're right. If they came out and explained, at least we would know which part or which hand they thought that, that it hit. You know, did it hit his fist as it went onto his chest? Did it hit his left arm? Did it hit his right arm? At least you kind of have an idea of the rationale. But you know, just to have this this um, this better complete that we just have to deal with. Um, and and as you say, and then leave, and then we're left with these kind of conspiracy theories. I mean, it is madness. Everyone keeps talking about how rugby they're mic'd up, and it just adds so much clarity because at least, you know, and the same way in, in American football where they have to come on and, and they actually have to mi- oh, press, press the microphone to explain the ruling. At least you have something to hang your hat on and say, okay, fine. I don't dis- I don't agree with it. I think it's a stupid decision, but at least I know what the decision is and why you've done it. Um, but I mean, the the Chris, the sorry, the the tweet by Chris March um, just after the game sums it up for me. He says where he says the purpose of VAR seems to be to find a way, any way, to disallow a goal, and that just goes completely against the spirit of the game, and it goes completely against things like you know back back in the day when they decided that being level was onside, given the the benefit of the doubt to the attacker. The idea was that you know to get more goals because goals are make games exciting. And now it just seems that the and they just seem to want to protect the defenses at any any cost um, when it comes to penalty decisions, goals. It just I don't know it drives me it drives me crazy. I guess the idea was to sort of um, get rid of the howlers, wasn't it? That's the whole that's surely the whole point of VAR, I and mean, it's it's doing anything but, isn't it? It's just the uh, yeah. Uh, so I think of a of a good analogy, making them out on a mole hill, something better. That sounds more cool than that, you know. Like, um, yeah, it's just a bit of a <laughs> complete farce. Uh, I don't know. If it, is it is it is it seen as as much of a joke in in other countries? VAR, L, you've probably got a better handle than most on on that. Is it like um, I, I don't think it is, right? Is it? Um, well, I mean, I've, with 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 Syria, I know, I know that they either think a. Uh... A questionable one over the weekend, but you know, I've when you watch 
when you watch it in the the Bundesliga as well. When I lived in Berlin, that was that you know it was just just part of football, but it it was it was used in a way that when I heard that VAR was being introduced in the Premier League, I thought that it would be really fair, and I felt like you know the way we talk about big club bias and stuff. I thought that would be quite eradicated for the reason that there's no there's no getting away from things now. It's there in in a replay. You can watch it. The referee gets another view, and it, it you know it's there for all to see. Because it and it was used so well there that I just thought that you know I was all for VAR, and it, it, it is a shame that VAR gets the the criticism. But really, the technology should be a brilliant uh, plus for the Premier League. It's it's unfortunately the people aren't using it correctly. But when when I've seen it used abroad, and I think you know we saw in the World Cup, there weren't any yeah. real controversies. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the. I I just feel that it's a shame that you know we we pay our hard earned money for you know season tickets, match tickets, subscriptions, and it makes the competition futile because the inconsistencies are just that all twenty teams are in a false position. It's not. It's not a table of who's won the most games. It's who's avoided the most <laughs> dodgy yeah. decisions. You know what I mean? So it it just makes the competition a bit futile. I think so. It's it is. It's a it's a shame because I think VAR should have really boosted the Premier League, and as you say, Paul, it's it's just um, you know magnified that those bad decisions. Because if the referee makes makes the call that Damari Gray's handballed it without VAR, you sort of I don't think we'd be as passionately to be uh, disputing it. But because we've all we've all seen it again and again and again, and we know that the referee and the official have had that opportunity, that's where the frustration is. Um, so yeah, as I say, I think it's a really, really useful technology, and it should have like you know really made things fair. But I think it's made it go the other way. Whatever we think of it, and wh- whether we go as far as L's kind of hint towards something sinister going on, maybe, or whether it's just a psychology <laughs> thing, it, it it definitely adds another layer of mess, doesn't it? I mean, if if that goal is given that the the referee sees it come off to Murray Gray in the stadium at that moment, that second in time, and he goes, uh, "Goal," um, then that's the decision. If he says no goal, then equally that's the decision. But because there's this layer of, well, what can we pick up? What, maybe that was a toenail there. Maybe that was a. It gives us this huge layer of mess that mm-hmm. we, 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 we thought it was going to get rid of. Um, it, so regardless of where we, what we think of it in terms of its performance and, and who's controlling it, um, we could do without the layer of mess because it's, you know, I don't know. It, I, 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 I hate technology in, in, in football, but that's me. I'm, I sound like I'm from the 1930s, but I, I, I hate any technology in football. <laughs> For me, I think as well, which is what's a frustration, particularly for the match going fans, it's it's the time it's taken as well. So I watched the first half of Fulham v Arsenal and uh, Martinelli, you know, got played in, put a ball, got saved, and then went in on after Robinson. And to the naked eye watching the TV screen, it was offside. He was ahead of the defense, it was clearly offside. They took about two minutes to draw a line. And that's where I have my doubts about, well, what are they looking for? What are they trying to give the goal? Like, are they trying to see how they can work it? I, <laughs> it does. I just, I, I think I sound stupid talking to, I don't believe it, but I, I just, that would be a logical explanation for how bad they are. If it, if it came out, <laughs> you're convincing uh, yourself. <laughs> they, they've been, they've been fixing results. We'll get, you'd go, well, that's why they've been so bad at this. Cause it doesn't make sense to get so many decisions. Just, wrong that they're wrong you know we've seen so many of them um you know the laws of the game some of it can be subjective but a lot of it is black and white and when you see a decision like we've seen with Damari Gray it just it baffles me that they can get to that point and then days later we still don't know what the reason is and and, you know it's got to be said as well it's this is a multi-million pound business and as Adam said if that if that goal was to cost us it could be season defining you know, goal difference could be, it's so tight down there. Goal difference could be a massive thing. And if we've lost the goal through that, you know, it, it wouldn't surprise you if you heard about, I, th- I think someone tweeted me, uh, you know, football clubs will take these guys to, to court. 
because so much is so much is riding on it, and I, you know, I'm sure you could never prove it. And it, you know, it very much likely is just sheer incompetence, and, and as you said, Lyndon, you know, the psychology of things. But but it is, it's it's big business, and it's really going to cost someone. <laughs> it is. I've had it put to me that the Premier League just want us out of the pre- out of the Premier League because we've we're such a pain in the backside with our finances. So there, there, there's a justification for your corruption right there, El. I don't, I don't think I I, I I wouldn't say that. I don't think they're biased towards any particular club. <laughs> but if if it was true, yeah. I'll put my tin foil hat back on. If it was true, I think it's more about keeping the narrative going. Keeping everything alive until the the thirty eight games, you know, top four, top six, relegation, um, because it is just it's watched all over the world, and and you know, you know, if if that if that game is two three four nil at half time, people will switch over to another game, which is more interesting. Um, but yeah, it is. It's just interesting. I'd love to know what the reason is for how bad they get these decisions. <laughs> Well, I love. Um, I just love how we, like in, into the moment you've got with that. I, I, I feel you, you you could talk for the four hours on this. Yeah, and, uh, you, pro- you, pro- you probably you probably will as soon as this yeah. finishes. <laughs> but... it, is, it just, I it, it just baffles, I, I just I don't understand. I mean, it, it the whole world at the moment. It's difficult to understand what's going on, isn't it? Really, with with politics and everything else. But it does. It just I just love to know why how how it got to that. But yeah, it's crazy. The fox, the rabbit, and the grain. But what's in the bag of grain? <laughs> <laughs> Is it spelt? Right. Let's move on from VAR. Um, I, uh, I'm just going back to uh, Paul. You mentioned some of those standout performances, and I think in the context of the Chelsea game, which is obviously going to be you know another difficult away test. Um, I think that's you know there are players like Adrissa Gay who I thought had another excellent game for the second the second game after that. Obviously his his calamity at Arsenal, Seamus Coleman, James Tarkovsky had one of those another one of those massive performances at the back. Um, Michael Keane I think was really good in the second half. Uh, obviously Dwight McNeil is coming into his own now um, in a way that I think is is really pleasing for those of us who watched him particularly in that Brighton game. And whichever game it was, was it Wolves where he was outrun by the referee? We were just we were questioning his commitment, and I and I don't think it was out of out of bounds to do so. I mean, he was really not looking not looking at home at all. Um, so I think if we look ahead to to Chelsea, um, the, which is the one away hoodoo that we haven't been able to break in recent times, twenty nine years now since we last won at Stamford Bridge. Um, so my question, I think, for whoever wants to jump in first, is. Uh, what uh, do you think our prospects are in this one, given that Graham Potter seems to have now been able to string a few results together and is sitting a bit more comfortably himself? And if DCL is fit, do you play him either uh, from the start or off the bench, or do you keep things as they are? I don't see a lot of changes, well, any changes really. Um, DCL, is it is it international break after after this weekend? Yes, I think so. So it would kind of almost seem... A bit of a a bit of a risk, even if he is sort of fully fit. If that makes sense to sort of play him, and then you know, I mean, it seems like it it kind of be more prudent to if he's available, have him handy on the bench to, to come on for twenty minutes or, or whatnot, and then bit more you know, <clears throat> another couple of weeks of training, and then he's then he's hopefully all good for the uh, for the Spurs game. Would probably seemingly make more sense to me. Um, you just can't can't see any changes, can you? Um, one one fellow, uh, Ben Godfrey, actually, uh, I thought he did really well. Um, and I think last week we were all sort of like, oh my god, he he, he won't be in the team. He's he, he's not a left back, and I think he, and he's not a left back. But um, one thing, Ben Godfrey, all, all the managers pick him, don't they? You know, what I mean, I think everyone that goes to Carlo and then Rafa and then Lamp Frank and and now seemingly Sean, they've all. Um, you know, they, they, they all seem to, he seems to be one they like to call upon. So I've never really rated him that much, but <laughs> I'm not a football manager. I don't know what to look out for as much as others do. And maybe there's obviously there's obviously something there. And we see there's a lot, a lot of good things that he does there. He's aggressive. He's tenacious. He works very really hard. He's committed. And maybe all them values are just what's standing in good stead because he's uh, I could see him being a fixture in the team now. 
Um, it seems to be if you come in and do well under Sean Sean Dyche, you tend to stay in the team. I think. Now there might be obviously exceptions to that when that when Dominic Carvalho becomes available, regardless of how well the Marvy Gray is doing. That'd be an interesting conundrum, actually, when that happens. What 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 happens there? Um, but I think you, you you come in, you do well, you, you stay in the team, and I think that, that I, I just don't see any any changes at all to the starting eleven. Um, it'd be a heck of a game, heck of a tough game. I mean, it's a bit of an ask. I mean, they they, they just won three on the balance. To, I suppose that Leeds and Leicester were probably both quite obliging, really, weren't they? And I think. Good old friend VAR was quite sorry, sorry Al was uh, was quite was quite was quite obliging <laughs> in the uh, in the in the Dortmund game. So maybe they haven't had the most difficult run. I guess one thing that I'm comfortable with is that should we lose against Chelsea, there's no panic because Sean Dyche he's got a good cool head on him there. Um, we've lost games already, obviously under him, and uh, there's no panic, and you don't you don't sense any panic amongst the team uh, when that happens. So in a in a in a sort of way, as you mentioned, Lennon, because we, we never really do well there. It's something of a free hit in a way. I think we we're kinda of saying that before before the Anfield derby really, so let's hope it doesn't go as badly as that did. But um I think it kind of is. But by that I don't think let's go hell for leather and sort of try and, you know, take the games them and try and outplay them or anything like that. But we just go and give it a good give it a good crack and dig in and if we lose then so be it. But I think you know, I think we can bank on the effort being there and uh Let's see what it gets us, eh? Yeah, I mean, if it hadn't have been for the last few Chelsea games, I think we'd be going there thinking we could certainly get a result. Uh, they have picked up. I think at some point they were bound to because of the quality they've got in the team, really. Um, uh, I, I'm I'm feeling quite confident about chances of getting something because of the way we've played. I mean, if you take out the anomaly that was Arsenal, really, but even then for 40 minutes, we did okay. You know, it it seemed to fall apart quite quickly afterwards. But I I think if if we can go and play like we did very much against, uh, let's say, Arsenal the first time round, um, I don't see a reason why we can't get something. Um, And and a point would be a great point, wouldn't it? Uh, I don't expect us to go and win there because we never do. But... um, I, 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 I'm, I'm confident, and I, like I said about the end of the the, the, um, the Brentford game, I kind of have this. I mean, don't get me wrong; I'm thinking about Everton twenty four seven, and I'm, I'm, I'm scared at my wits that something bad's going to happen. But I think there is this kind of foundation of we're in good hands, and this feels like it's not a panic scenario like it was last year. I mean, I think what we said at the beginning of the pod about. Last year, it very much felt like we were dropping and that was the really scary bit where this year we've kind of been there most of the time and now we are gradually improving. And I just have that sense of calm about it at the moment that, okay, if we go there and we get beat, all right, it probably our, our season was probably never going to be defined on what happened at Stamford Bridge. It hasn't been for the last 29 years or whatever it was. So um, a point would be great. If we play like we have done recently for an hour, I think there's a good chance we will get a point. Um, but it's it, like Paul just said, it's not the end of the world if we don't. Um, I suppose just 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 it, before an international break, it would be nice to get something and not be in that bottom three over the international break. That would be the, the goal, I guess. Um, and looking at the other fixtures, mm, I don't know whether we'll still be out there with a defeat, but... Anyway, yeah, um, it would be nice to not be in the bottom three looking at that for an international break. As for Calvert-Lewin, as for Calvert-Lewin, I don't know what he'll do. I think he'll probably play Gray because Gray's been pretty good, I would say. I, I, if, if it was me, I'd leave Calvert-Lewin out until after the international break. I'd, I'd only play Calvert-Lewin off the bench, I think, as you mentioned, Paul, for like 20 minutes at the end. Dep- it, well, regardless, really, of what position we're in, I think... If if he's available and ready, but if not, then yeah, let's err on the side of caution because I think that that final stretch of of games is where we really need him. And I think um, said it a few times, but the way we're playing will obviously really suit him. So let's have the best version of him available to do that. Um, so yeah, I can see it being an unchanged side, and and I agree. I've, I've yeah, famous last words, but I, I have got that sense that we might get something. Um, 
we got something under Benitez, didn't we, with a, a patched up side um, where Branthwaite scored. And um, I think they're, they're kind of similar to Spurs and Manchester United, but on paper it looks kind of daunting. But all sides who are patchy, but they haven't got the consistency and that's why they're, um, yeah, not not in the happiest of places. And I think Chelsea, yes, three wins on um, the spin is a good position to be in. But I think if we can frustrate them in the same way that we did at Brentford, um, against Brentford, sorry, um, they're a really good attack inside Brentford, really well organised, really well drilled. And apart from a couple of the shaky moments, one of them caused by the goalkeeper heading it a mile wide, we, we restricted them chances-wise. So... If we can do a similar thing against Chelsea and frustrate them and try and offer something on the break, which in that second half against Arsenal, but bar that very late chance, we didn't really we didn't redo, really we didn't stretch them. If we can do that against Chelsea, then who knows? But a point would be great because that, that would be three unbeaten for us. We'd have that international break where hopefully Deitch can do more with that break than Lampard did with his breaks, where he would speak very positively and proactively about all that was going to happen on the training ground. And then you'd sort of have Amadou and Anna come out and say, oh, Frank Lampard's the best one in training. So you'd, you'd wonder what was actually happening in those spells. I think that that break will do us some good, not just in terms of getting Calvert-Lewin fit, but um, maybe allowing as well some of the players who have been working the socks off. You alluded to it with McNeil and, and it, it's worth just spelling out again how improved he has been in the last few weeks. Mm-hmm. And it was a, a, a fantastic finish, but... Also, his, his his fitness levels have really improved. Decore, Garner Gay, all, all of these guys have been doing really hard yards. So I think that break will be really useful for that as well because that that home straight, even if we are feeling a bit more comfortable now, it's going to be tough and there are going to be bumps in the road. And I'm sure there'll be the odd week where we, we kind of fall back into it. But I think what makes us feel a little bit more comfortable in our position is that there are so many other sides who are who are panicking as well. I think if we can keep a cool head and and play pretty much the way we did on Saturday in the home games and offer something away from home, I think we should we should have enough, shouldn't we? I think I think for me it all hinges on Chelsea because I think with Everton, what you see is what you get, and that that's a compliment to Everton that mm. you know Sean Dyche has us playing in a way. But I feel like at the stage we're at, if Chelsea are on it, which they haven't been, but if they're on it, I do think you know. We do well to get a point. Um, so, but I think if Chelsea are below par, then that gives us a real a real shot. And you know, as I say, that is a compliment to Deitch that I think probably where he's coming with Everton and where Potter's coming with Chelsea, I think Deitch is probably further into where he wants to be than Potter is. I think Potter is still, you know, trying to work a lot of things out, maybe getting people on side to buy in that sort of thing. So, for me, I think it's if if Chelsea are on their A game, I think it's it's a a difficult, you know, a difficult match, but I do think we can still get something. Um, but you know, if, if they're not on it, I think, you know, I am quietly confident about what we what we could do. But it's all about those little moments, you know. As we saw in the derby, we've hit the post and then they've gone down the other end. And Chelsea, are one of those sides, they've got they've got match winners all over the pitch. You know, it's a it's a struggling team, but you know they've got Jao Felix just just coming in in January that you know he can he can score from anywhere. So. For me, it is. It's 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 all about Chelsea, I think, and where they're at. Um, and for me, I think with Calvert Lewin, you know, we don't know the extent of his sort of rehabilitation and how he is. But because it's been so uh, up and down over the eighteen months, I'd almost have a plan to maybe only use him in the home games, for example, because Everton are in the ascendancy and you can use him more. Whereas maybe away from home, it's it's more making the ball stick. But I think. Maybe away from home, if you're on the counter attack, Damari Gray actually suits that. So obviously, you'd like Calvert Lewin to be your main man for every single game. But you know, if, if it's about managing the situation, if I was Deitch, I'd maybe pick the five games in the season that you absolutely want Calvert Lewin. And you know, ideally, they may be two weeks apart because um, you know we just don't know where he's at with that. But for me, it's especially at Chelsea. It's it's as we've said, it's it's not a free hit as such, but. It's a game where Damari Gray is sort of he's shown in the last two games that he he can lead the line and it's it's just the fact that that it works is that I, I just think the ball sticks just for that second longer when he's there and I think his movements as well I think it helps the midfield because I think he moves the opposition defence about 
So for me, I'd, I'd, I'd be quite happy to see Damari Gray start up front. And just going back to what Paul said about Godfrey, I, I think Godfrey just, he gives everything a lift. I think he's he's just got an energy about him. Um, and I think he's well suited to Everton because, you know, he, he does go in hard with his challenges. He's, you know, fully committed in, in what he does. And I feel like he's he's almost been a a victim of all the uncertainty around Everton. I feel like if he'd come into a settled side, I think he's got the capabilities to be a really good centre back. And I think it's I think his versatility is probably gone against him. I know that he's not he's not really excelled at centre back and you know, he's not that assured at centre back. But I feel in terms of his development, you know, this is he's been here about three years now and it's it just hasn't clicked for him and Everton just because of you know, he, he was struck down with, with COVID, so that was very difficult for him to get back. Then he hasn't ever been sort of starting in his own position. You know, he's never he's either been a uh you know, filling in for a centre back or filling in for 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 a, a full back. So for me it's 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 been a difficult time for him. Just he hasn't really settled into a position. But you know, we look back Jolene Lescott was used in different positions. I know Phil Jagielka was occasionally used in defensive midfield. Leighton Baines couldn't even get ahead of Nuno Valente, could he? But then all of a sudden, they just get given that chance of a run in the team. And I think Ben Godfrey can do that. And for me, looking ahead of of all the centre-backs that we've got, you know, we've got so many centre-backs. For me, I, I would like to see him next to Tarkovsky, just because I think out of the, the options, I know Michael Keane's come in and... You know he's probably Sean Dyche's man because they know each other really well. But for me, I think, I think Godfrey, you know, he he's not that young anymore. But I think he's, you know, he can he can grow into a a really capable defender. So I'm glad we've got him, and I, I just think that he needs to run in the side and t- to make that position his own. Really, I just um I just looked at the fixtures for this coming week. So before we even play, so before before the weekend is here. Palace would have gone to Brighton, Southampton would have hosted Brentford, and Forest would have been home to Newcastle. So that's before we even start. Then the, the, the fixtures Saturday, Villa Bournemouth, Brentford Leicester, Southampton Spurs and Wolves Leeds. That's all before we play. Mm-hmm. We're at half five kickoff, aren't we? <laughs> so, I mean... Yes. I, we we may we may well think differently about what a point can do um by then i don't know um that is that's three three or four days worth of my life where i'm going to be watching a lot of other teams results <laughs> yes <laughs> we're all all of a sudden we're brentford fans I think, I think that's been one of the most frustrating things about the last few years is that i spent two years basically being a man city fan as well because we needed them to win the league. <laughs> and now the last two years, you, you're just supporting about whoever's playing our, our rivals. I just I just want to get back to focus fully on Everton's results. <laughs> well, that's what we all hoped this this season would be. That's what we all said. Oh, it's a nice ordinary, normal season when you finish about 12th, 13th. Mm-hmm. You still might finish about 13th, I suppose. But you know what I mean? <laughs> that, 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 uh, <laughs> looks like a normal season, doesn't it, when you finish there? But it's so tight down there this year. But uh Guess we were dreaming back in back in August, expecting that, weren't we? Um, still a way to go. You're listening to the Toffee Web Podcast. All right. Well, as you know, we pose ourselves a weekly question, and this week it concerns the quickest goals Everton have scored in the Premier League era. Of course, it doesn't have to be in a league game. Uh, we'll, but we'll keep it to the last 30 years. Uh, Dwight McNeil's after 35 seconds, puts him in the top 10 now, pushing out uh, Dominic Calvin-Lewin's unorthodox overhead kick at Arsenal in 2020. Uh, so, fellas, what's the Everton goal scored in the first minute of a game that's the most memorable for, memorable for you? Oh, we're chomping at the bit, aren't we? Uh, I'll I'll go with um, the David Unsworth goal uh, against Fulham uh, in David Moyes' first game in charge. Partly because it, it's kind of a similar goal to the Dwight McNeil goal in terms of a left-footed player striking across uh, across goal. Um, it was, yeah. But also incredibly important. It set it set the tone for that era. Um, went down to ten men, didn't we? Um, after that, um, and also had to hold on in that game. But um, it was it was a really important result again when we needed it. Um, and it it was an early goal that didn't end in that 
nagging feeling that I described before where you feel like you've scored too early, um, which, again, I'm so relieved that Saturday wasn't a case of that because there are other notable examples where that has most definitely been the case. Does that mean you've got one, El? <laughs> no, I, th- I think for me, the most uh, one of the memorable ones where it just really took me by surprise was... Um... Kevin Campbell, when he arrived on loan from Trevonspor, I was, I was a young kid back then. He'd he'd got his double against uh, Coventry, and then you know, thirty seconds in, we score at Newcastle, which you know at, at the time, you know, Newcastle had obviously been in a a title race a few years before, you know, and it was just totally unexpected. And he was just so different to other Everton players I'd seen before. He was just. You know, it was put on a plate to him and he scored. And, you know, to we ended up winning the game 3-1 as well. So, for me, that was when I first got into Everton, we didn't win that many games away. I mean, we haven't anyway in the time that I've supported them. But, <laughs> What's new, Al? But, yeah, but, but, you know, at that, at that time, that was just a really big result. And it was all down to, like, Kevin Campbell, you know, this this hero, this, this just goal-scoring god who just arrived. And then, obviously, later... In the season, he he got those nine goals in sort of six games and and basically saved us. And it was just, you know, I think what was memorable about it was he he gave me, as a young Evertonian, that hope and belief. And, you know, Duncan Ferguson's my main hero, but I think if I go back to at that time, in the moment, I think, you know, Super Kev was the one. Um, So, yeah, that that one always sticks out to me. Did, Did Scott Gemmell score a good goal in that game, if I recall? I think he did. Yeah, Campbell got a brace, and I think it was Gamble, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, mine's Lukaku. He was against Bournemouth in that 6 3 win when he scored after about 30 seconds or so. It was just such a good, such a good a hit. I think you mentioned the other week, uh, Lyndon, about like how hard he used to strike the ball, and that couldn't have been better exemplified than that. And I think it's just because it was just such a mad game. I think I think he scored four mm. that day. And uh, yeah, just, like, just to get off. Sometimes I don't know it's. Uh, you get off to a fly like that, and it just feels great. Obviously, it always feels great if you score that early in the game, but it was just, I don't know, it was just that sense. Bournemouth for crap. They were there for the take. It was just like, yeah, we're going to hammer these. And uh, I think we were, we were fleeing a lot or something like that. Then did they get it back to 3-2? Or did they, yeah. got, they ran as cloaks for the while anyway before we finally ran away with it. But it was uh, a heck of a game. Wasn't the game with I Ross Barkley celebrating before? He yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah it's a mad game, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a mad game. So... That's my one. Another one at Goodison I would call was Chris, it's not, not an Everton one, unfortunately, Chris Sutton scoring for Blackbird after about 12 seconds or something like that in a real tough, tough game. We were unlucky to lose, but that was a, another one that sticks in my mind. But Sorry, we were talking about Everton goals, so sorry to talk about opposition goals. I'll uh, let Andy choose one now. <laughs> well, the, you've just said that it, it always feels great when you score an early goal. And the one time it didn't was the cup final. Um, and I, 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 I couldn't get tickets. So I was watching it on telly and I was, um, I invited a few people round, and I, I was with my girlfriend at the time who wasn't necessarily into football. So it was kind of trying to explain what was happening. You know, um, this is a, this is a huge thing. This is a big deal. We have probably <laughs> not got a chance because they're really good, but you know, um, and, and we all sat down to watch it, as you do. And then 25 seconds later, Everton had scored. And of course, other people, they weren't Everton fans as such, but they were obviously there supporting with me, my mates on the day. Everybody jumped up. And I remember, I'm not making this up. I, I, I'm not trying to kind of um, over catastrophize it. But I remember just putting my head in my hands <laughs> and being completely quiet and thinking, oh, no. No, I mean, <laughs> if you if you we can ever do that for a cup final goal when you go one nil up, it's just a real clash of emotion because you 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 could get that kind of obviously that Everton have just scored in a cup final, so I'm I'm not devastated, but immediately I thought that's not going to end well, uh, and it, it just had that overriding feeling to it. Um, and that was the most well, it obviously was the most surprising because I, I didn't you know I didn't think we'd give as much of a chance that day. Especially with the, we had some injuries, didn't we? In suspensions, was it? Was that the one that um, you'll remind me who played at left back? Um, oh, Scandinavian. Lars Jakobsen. Lars Jakobsen. Yeah. Well, I I truly believe. He, well, he came on second half. Uh, I think for Hibbeth. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because him had had a him, him had had a mare. Yeah, I'm convinced if Lars Jacobsen starts that game, I think we win. That's that's how bad Hibbert what like Flora Maluda the ball over the top all the time. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. I just remember thinking we probably haven't got a hope today, and when we scored, it wasn't a case of oh wow okay, it was more of a oh this is even this is going to be even more heartbreaking now, um, <laughs> and I don't know whether that goes for everybody for that goal. But I I, um, I was just shell shocked because it was my first cup final uh, watching Everton. I was I was obviously taken in the occasion and the day and the the sunshine and the you know the the brightness and the vibrancy of it. And you know, I, as I say, I've I started supporting Everton just after the last win. So for me, it was you know fifteen years of pent up, <laughs> just waiting and longing. And so for that goal to go in, I was just, I, th- I think I was lost. I was just lost. I I couldn't believe that we'd. And I thought, is this genuinely going to going to happen? Because obviously, that what it was for that cup run and what gave me real belief when Saha scored was. We'd beaten some really good sides to get there, you know. We'd we'd beaten Liverpool, we'd beaten Villa, we'd beaten you know got overcome Middlesbrough, who at the time were you know a good side in the quarters, and then we'd beaten Man United on penalties, and it was just I just remember feeling those mm. nerves, and I, I just remember being just so bewildered because at that time as well, with it being a cup final, I think I was still taking it all in, and I don't think I was particularly watching the action like I ordinarily would. It was just. Oh my god, it's the cup final because you don't expect to score that quick. So yeah, it was just incredible, and it was one of those I think where it hits the net and there's because Evertonians are in the other end. It's you know sometimes when there's a delay, the ball mm. hits the net and you hear the mm. the crowd cheer. It was just yeah, amazing. Especially in a cup final, you always heard at yeah. Wembley. You always get that at Wembley. It must be because of the <laughs> because it's so big, I guess. But yeah. mm. incredible. Yeah. Mm. I think I had the same feeling as you, Andy. Not quite, not quite as as sort of despondent, if you like. But when you did feel like there's there's scoring early, and then there's scoring early. <laughs> that was <laughs> early against the team. You know that that was really no arguments that much better than us on on, on paper. I don't know whether it was a despondency. Um, I mean, it was it was more my mind instantly switched to the problems that this yes. caused. Yes, mm. yeah, no, and I agree. I think I felt the same way. Yeah, yeah, which is never, never a nice feeling in a cup final. But I suppose that's uh, that's that's our lot, really. Uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of the most, the most memorable, that's obviously up there. The um, you know, you can't really top the the Unsworth one was versus Fulham just because of what it meant and and if for a new manager and and particularly the way that we held out, having had a was it Tommy Graveson had mm. one of his moments and made mm. that game much much harder. Now the one that immediately came to my mind was Olivia Decours at Liverpool the, in the Anfield derby because I think that was um, that one was before the Campbell one, correct? That was the one in the spring. I think before Kevin Campbell's goal, so it would have been a while since we'd won there, and it just felt like, um, you know, we had a new team, and we had. I felt it felt at the time like we were going somewhere, particularly with players like the core in there, and it just, you know, for us to then go and throw it all away was, of course, very Everton at Anfield, but um, that one, the nature of the goal as well, because it was a fantastic goal. Um, so that was the one that, that that first came to mind, and then. Um, I was looking looking at that that video compilation of the of the top ten quickest goals uh, that Everton have scored, and there were a couple in that I had no memory of. Uh, the one of John Ebel at Wimbledon in '96, I think that was New Year's Day, but I was so hung over that day that that's probably why I don't remember that one at all. I remember Duncan Ferguson got uh, got the winner, obviously, but John Ebel scoring after 23 seconds, I don't remember that at all. But um, yeah, we don't score enough early goals, I think. It's, it is memorable when we do. Yeah, just one last one from me as well, and it's similar to Paul about the opposition. I can't remember what the reason was, but I remember running down Goodison Road and hearing Zed cars. I was I was late for the game, and it was 2014 at home to Chelsea. Um, it was the game when I think Samuel Esu scored one of his first goals for Everton. But I got into the Gladys Street, and you know where the Gladys Street? It's a bit of a a post box as you go up the steps, and you can see. I just vividly remember hearing the groans because Ivanovic had scored after three minutes. And I thought, I can't believe it. I'm late. I'm a 1 0 down. Looked at the scoreboard. It was 2 0. Costa had scored in the first minute. So I, I was three minutes late and we were losing 2 0 already and it ended up finishing 6 3. 
So that's that's my bad memory of of early goals as well. Did well to get two six for these in the early goal uh, in the early goal chat, didn't we? <laughs> okay, well, thanks for that, fellas. So we'll leave it there for this week, and uh, we'll be return next week to review the game at Stamford Bridge, where hopefully Everton have picked up um, something to take into that international break and uh, the final what is it ten matches of the season after that. Uh, So until then, Blues, as always, thanks for listening. Take care and up those toughies.